good evening. So wonderful to be with you this evening. I'm so thankful to be part of this lectureship. And when Jerry asked me to uh, preach before you, I, I was tickled to death. I was so excited uh, to be a part of this. And as we appeal to truth in our lectureship about some issues that are very serious, that need to be talked about, it doesn't really mean a hill of beans if we don't know what truth is as we appeal to the truth. And I appreciate Brother Jerry's lessons this morning on how we establish authority. But if we don't identify that the Bible is truth, then it really means nothing. There are many things out there that claim that they are truth, but as we will see this evening, the Bible verifies its claim. We won't look at outside evidence uh, supporting the Bible. That's beyond the scope of this lesson. But we want to look at some very important characteristics of truth according to the Scriptures. And if you remember Pilate in his interaction with Jesus in John 18, after Jesus states his purpose to testify to the truth, Pilate asks a very important question that every individual must face at some point. He asks the question, what is truth? Now the attitude of Pilate has been speculated on for some time. Maybe he was jesting, which could be evident by his not staying for an answer from Jesus. Or maybe he wanted to know the current situation that was going on between Jesus and the Jews. But what if he was actually sincere in his question? In desiring to know the truth. The Scriptures do not tell us exactly But it wouldn't be difficult to accept this last suggested attitude when we think of the religious practices of that time in the Roman era. Romans did not hold to a central belief, but on a mixture of superstitions, of taboos and rituals that were collected over many years from many different countries. Many times after the Romans defeated a country, they would accept that defeated country's God into their religious practices. So the Romans had many different gods that that led to conflicting practices. What was true for one Roman may not be exactly true for another Roman. And so it wouldn't be difficult to understand why Pilate would ask this question, what is truth? And there are many today who are just as confused as Pilate may have appeared. Today we are facing a new type of apostasy in a new suit, in a different package with similar effects in the world today. And this frame of thought has infected our society so deeply that its core concepts are within our music, within our television, within our schools, our universities, our movies, our politics, and even our religious practices. And this worldview that I am speaking about has been termed postmodernism. Now, I have to say that one thing that's against me is that I know Caleb Westbrook. He's a good friend of mine, and I worshiped with him up in McKinney for a couple of years. And I know about April 2014, he presented a sermon here at Parkview concerning postmodernism. And it was a wonderful, wonderful lesson. I listened to it. And I, I won't go in quite as much detail as he did. But I do want to talk about some facets of postmodernism that has begun to shape many Christian denominational values that we have. And unfortunately, it is beginning to affect our own brethren. I want to spend some time in talking about these basic tenets of postmodernism, two of them to be precise, and ask the question, what is truth? And see how the Bible contrasts to what society and culture is telling us today. Now, my goal is not to give a full, detailed review of postmodernism. I don't plan on doing that. Because it's hard to give a single definition of what postmodernism is because of the nuances and the concepts that are involved, but I want to talk about two of these basic tenets this evening. 
The first one is autonomous individualism. And in a simple statement, it is the belief that there is no absolute truth. And this mindset has brought about a subjective truth that relies on one's own personal experiences and perspectives to shape his or her own reality. No longer is there an absolute objective standard of truth outside one's own existence, but a relative truth based on one's own temporary experiences. And this has led to this second tenet of postmodernism, which is absolute moral relativism. David Dockery in his book, The Challenge of Postmodernism, says that postmodernism makes an idol of witless, inexpensive moral toleration. It views all moral values as arbitrarily contingent upon the changing social and psychological determinants of human cultures. In other words, moral relativism denies the ability of knowing an absolute standard of good and evil. You may have heard the statement, well, my belief is no better than your belief. And your belief is no better than my belief. There are many different roads to the same destination. And this teaching of absolute moral relativism proposes that the source of moral values is not based on a universal truth, but on the needs of a society and a culture that is destined to change. Do you see the problem here? Truth is ever changing. It's fluid. It's not constant. It's not grounded. And if they are able to deny the possibility of knowing an absolute standard of ethics and morals, then they are able to allow for everyone to follow their own self-determined standards. And my friends, this mindset is the breeding ground for the problems we have with religious pluralism. However, the Bible stands in stark contrast to the postmodern mindset of today regarding the nature of truth. And that's what I want to do tonight is look at five characteristics of truth as described by God's word and see how they compare to what the world is telling us today. First is that the truth is objective. When we talk about the concept of objectivity in regards to various worldviews, we're talking about the state or quality of being true outside of a subject's own individual biases, their own interpretations, feelings, or imaginings. In other words, the truth is something that exists beyond someone's own subjective viewpoint. What is true, what is truly, absolutely true, is true for everyone. And the Bible uses the word truth and the concept of truth in an objective capacity. Jesus says in John 17 and verse 17, Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Now this statement is not motivated by a subjective nature of man, but it's a description of an objective reality that goes beyond one's own personal interpretations and biases. 2 Peter 1 and verse 20 and 21, Peter talks about the inspiration of the Scriptures. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. You see, the truth, what is absolutely true, goes beyond human intervention. And just as much as God is an unchanging constant, so is His Word. Look with me in 1 Peter 1, 23-25. 1 Peter 1, 23-25. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring Word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. And again in Psalm 119 and verse 89, Lord, your word is forever. It is firmly fixed in heaven. The scriptures clearly teach that truth does not change depending on who's viewing it. Therefore, it is objective and universal in its existence. 
Therefore, if it is universal in its existence, it is applicable to all. You remember what Paul said to the Athenians in Acts 17, 30 and 31. Acts 17, 30 and 31. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because He has set a day on which He is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man He has appointed. And notice this, Paul points to outside evidence. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising Him from the dead. Everyone, everywhere, in every time period, and in all walks of life will be judged by the Word of God. Despite past experiences, despite personal biases. John 12 and verse 48, Jesus says, He who rejects Me and does not receive My sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. No matter the subjective or changing views of humanity, the truth is grounded. It is constant and it applies to everyone. Well, since truth is objective in its nature, then it, and it contains the quality of being in existence outside the mind of the individual, then it can be communicated and it can be understood. Because truth exists without human intervention, it has the ability, the ability to be known and understood through personal learning and discovery. And this is very different from the postmodern mindset of today because postmodernism teaches and those who propose postmodernistic teachings propose that language is unreliable. It was just arbitrarily made up and created by the current society and culture, so it's ever-changing. And it's unreliable. However, humanity has the ability to grow intellectually through communicated words and written communicated words. Through observation and study beyond someone's own previous knowledge base. Look with me in Ephesians 5 and verse 17. Paul says to the, the people at Ephesus, the Christians in Ephesus, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do you remember Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch? What does Philip ask the Ethiopian eunuch? Do you understand what you are reading? See, Philip knew that there was a written communication, there was a point, there was a message to be made to someone through those written words. He didn't say, how do you interpret this? You have a different experience than I have. You have a different background than I have. What does this mean to you? No, the message was concerning Jesus and there was a message to be brought out. And what did the Ethiopian eunuch ask or say? How can I unless someone guides me? Unfortunately, these postmodern ideas have begun to creep into the mindset of our own brethren. Many are beginning to argue that not everyone will agree on the truth, which means that no one will ever be able to fully arrive at the truth. And not only will you never be able to fully arrive at the truth, but you are arrogant if you say that you know the truth and you fully know the truth. Therefore, what's the point of struggling and striving for for unity on these issues such as marriage, divorce, and remarriage, on the issues of modesty, of social drinking, of gender roles within the church and within the marital relationship. Doctrinal matters such as these have begun to fall into the realm of liberties that are seen within Romans 14. Matters of indifference. No longer are brethren challenging this false doctrine, but are accepting that it is not possible for two people to understand the Bible alike, which results in multiple truths that are equally valid. And these same brothers and sisters of Christ will propose unity and multiple diverse understandings of the truth rather than unity in our teaching and our practice. So the emphasis is not on the Word of God, but on the experience with the Word of God, based on someone's individual perceptions and past experiences and biases. 
The result of Bible study becomes what the passage means to me rather than what the passage demands of all of us. However, my friends, God's Word can be known. And it can have a shared meaning between individuals and a shared understanding through the written Word. Jesus speaks of this ability of humanity to know the truth in John 8, 31 and verse 32. 31 and 32. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in Him, if you continue or if you abide in My Word, then you are truly disciples of Mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Was this a false promise from Jesus? How arrogant of you to say that you know the truth. However, the truth has the ability to be communicated through words that contain a shared meaning among individuals. However, there are brethren who say that, well, words are ever changing, so therefore we should use, superimpose our own definitions of words into the written word. My friends, baptism doesn't mean baptism in Miriam's Webster's dictionary anymore, it doesn't mean immersion or to submerge. Fellowship has changed its meaning. Wine, the word wine has changed its meaning. We have to be careful when we superimpose our own current definitions within what the writers were trying to communicate. We see Luke stating this reality that words can be shared among individuals and agreed upon. When Luke, in Luke 1, 3-4, when he says to Theophilus, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth, the exact truth, about the things which you have been taught. We see Luke re-emphasizing that truth contains the ability to both be communicated and known. He doesn't say, well, here, here are a couple of facts. You interpret it the way you want to interpret it, Theophilus, since I know you have a different background than I do. What is truth for you may not be truth for me. He knew that there was the ability to agree on the communicated word. Although this is not always easy. We see that with the Ethiopian eunuch, do we not? He needed guidance. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. Accurately handling the word of truth. If there's an exhortation to accurately handle the word of truth, doesn't that necessarily infer that there's an ability to inaccurately handle the word of truth? Peter talks about this and warns about this concerning Paul's writings, how they were, be, they were difficult to understand in 2 Peter 3 and verse 16, and they were susceptible to distortion and misunderstanding. When he says in 2 Peter 3 and verse 16, the untaught and unstable twist them to their own destruction as they also do the rest of the Scriptures. You see, the responsibility lies on both the student and the teacher to properly handle the Word of God as it is being taught and communicated. Look with me in 2 Peter 3 and verse 17 and 18, emphasizing the point that we can grow in our knowledge base. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have the ability to grow in the knowledge of the truth in a real and a grounded way. This is not a mystic way. Through study and observation. The next characteristic of truth that we see as communicated by God's Word is that truth corresponds to reality. If someone said it to you that the sun is 300 times larger than the earth, we would all assume that that statement would reflect and correspond to reality. And it would actually exist outside the mind of an individual. But if I was to say that it is a fact that the earth is larger than the sun, then you would realize that that statement did not cor correspond with reality, the reality that I felt like I was communicating. 
And the Bible claims and verifies its claim that truth by its very nature corresponds to reality. Whether this is past, present, or future events. Look with me in Romans 1, 18 through 21. Romans 1, 18 through 21. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give Him thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Skip on down to verse 25. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Paul makes it clear to the Romans that God has manifested the truth to everyone outside of His Word. The creation itself can attest to the truth of a supreme creator. However, there will always be and always have been those who will suppress the truth. Who will exchange the truth of God for a lie. And they may be sincere. Is this any different from the postmodernistic views of today? Postmodernism denies the fact that there is one God and makes man his own God and determiner of truth. Now, you're never going to find somebody who says, I'm a postmodernist. But we see these postmodernistic ideas rampant throughout the, our culture and our society. The Bible demonstrates that for something to be true, it cannot be a false representation of reality. Look with me in 1 John 2. 1 John 2 starting at verse 21, going through verse 22. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? As we said before, there are many written works that claim that they are the truth. And simply accepting a concept does not mean one believes the actual truth. Outside evidence must support that concept in order for it to be an accepted reality that is true for everyone. And while we're on the topic of being harmonious and corresponding to reality, we look to our next point, which is that the truth is harmonious. And this point hinges on the acceptance of the previous aspects of truth. That because truth is objective and corresponds to reality, then it cannot contradict itself. The Bible communicates to us that God and His Word are not the source of confusion or disorder. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33. And the Bible describes the singularity and harmony of the truth by demonstrating that contradictions cannot come from the same source. This is very different from works of Buddhism and works of Hinduism that pride themselves in contradictions. Do we see the Book of Mormon and the Book of Quran corresponding to reality or being harmonious? When we study these works, we will see that they are not. Paul makes it clear that the truth has to be harmonious in Galatians 1, verse 6 through 9. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so again I say now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. What were these false teachers teaching that got Paul in such an uproar? Was he teaching in a different God? Was he teaching that Jesus was not Lord? Human reasoning may say it's a little bitty detail. And they wanted circumcision, a few works of the law. What's the big deal? 
My friends, there are brethren who will take a passage and will, and will yank it out of context and will not look at the remote context and the immediate context and apply it. And yet it's not harmonious with the rest of Scripture. The truth cannot say opposing things or present differing versions of reality and still be true. It cannot be true, going back to our example, that the sun is larger than the earth and the earth is larger than the sun. Both of these statements cannot be true because they are contrary to one another. Therefore, either one is true and the other is false or both are false. Both cannot be true because the realities that they affirm contradict each other. So that puts a responsibility on us, does it not? To make sure that those who are teaching, who stand up in this pulpit, are teaching the truth. Teaching the harmony of the truth. We see that with the example of the Bereans. That the Bereans did not just accept Paul's preaching at face value. Rather, they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. If truth were not harmonious, then there would be no way of telling what is true and what is false. The harmony of truth is reflected in the unity of the Word of God. And for us to have unity in practice, we must rely on the unity and harmony of the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Many of our own brethren have bought into the idea that there can be a unity and a diversity of opinions on very various issues that are quote-unquote non-essential Bible doctrine. As long as we believe in core Bible concepts, then the non-essential teachings of the Bible can be disagreed upon as long as there is a desire to do what is right. But unfortunately, that list gets longer and longer and longer. Our practice and teaching must be compared and contrasted to the totality of the word of truth. Acts 20 and verse 27, Paul tells the Ephesians, For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. In order for followers of Christ to be truly unified, true unity, our manner of life should be one that maintains fellowship with Him by looking at the sum total of God's Word. 1 John 1, verse 5-6, through 6, This is the message which we have heard from Him and announced to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. My friends, there are people who are saying that we can have a multiplicity of opinions on truth. However, they are compromising the truth. Our final characteristic that we'll look, up, look at this evening, according to the Word of God, is that truth is necessary. Postmodernistic ideas propose that truth is just based on your own perceptions. It's just the electrical impulses in your brain and whatever you perceive or whatever you sense, that's truth to you, but it's ever-changing. But so much of our daily living is based upon the concept of a singular truth. Our beliefs and practices are founded on some sort of absolute truth in order to be able to interact with one another and the environment around us. Without this foundation, we would not have a consistent way of interacting with one another or the reality around us. Think about this. The Bible never deals with the law of gravity, but the concept of gravity can be understood when there is acceptance of a singular truth. Because the existence of a supreme creator is a universal truth, it is not difficult to accept that a creator has designed universal laws or truths in a physical world. This absolute truth allows us to rely on a consistent reality that we can grow to understand and know. We see this 
The Bible presents this clearly in John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word. That's fact. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being. In Him was life, and the light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it comprehended. That begins our worldview. And we build upon that. However, there are those who are in darkness and they do not want to comprehend it. Because once they accept that there is an external singular truth, then they have, they have given up their ability to determine their own truth. This evening we've discussed the characteristics of truth and how the Bible presents a very different view of truth that our society is presenting today. And it's beginning to infect our own brethren. Through the disguise of passages such as Romans 14, where the list grows longer and longer on things that are matters of indifference. The Bible teaches that the truth is objective. It's grounded in reality. It's unchanging and it's universal. The Bible communicates this truth with words that have a shared meaning that can be understood and known. Truth corresponds to an external reality and it's not determined by our subjective views. And finally, we've talked about the nature of objective truth. That it consists of being harmonious and consistent. And this allows us to necessarily rely on the truth in order to to live and interact with the world. Do you accept the truth? Will you accept the truth? There are some important topics that we're going to be um, talking about the rest of this lectureship, and I know that I'm going to be listening to these on YouTube. And they're going to be appealing to that one truth. And if you are not a Christian, I feel that the truth is very clear on how to become a child of God. We have to hear the Word. We have to believe we have to repent and confess, and then finally we have to be baptized. Baptism now saves you. Not the removal of filth from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a pure conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. However, as we are buried in that watery grave of baptism, we raise again to walk a new life, to be a new creature. And we are to walk worthily of the gospel to which we have been called, Ephesians 4 and verse 1. Are you willing to accept that this evening? I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you this evening, and hopefully you've gained something from this study. I know I have. I appreciate you very much. We ask you to respond to the invitation now as we stand and as we sing.